So, well, I'm excited to be with you uh, this morning and just gathered together. Um, in, in case you haven't noticed from the, the crazy lights and everything that you've been seeing, we are in the midst of this new series called Glow, understanding the biblical principle that God has called his people to be a light in the world or in places or in the community where people do not yet know, love, and follow him. In scripture, we see those places where he is not present, often referred to as places of darkness, implying that the people there, in including us apart from God, when we are apart from God, we are considered as lost. We are considered as broken. We are considered as in need of help. We need rescue. And throughout history, God has sent people into these places of darkness to glow and or be a light. Last week, we learned about a couple of these guys by the name of Paul and Barnabas, how they were being sent, highlighting for us what our key verse for this series, really in Acts 13, 47, where uh, the Lord had really said to them through others and, and through himself, I have made you a light for the Gentiles that you may bring salvation to the ends of the earth. I think that is a really key verse for us to grab onto, for us to hang onto. I have made you a light for the Gentiles that you may bring salvation to the ends of the earth. In fact, if you're here today in the congregation or you're joining at home, I'm going to ask us to say that together, even though it may be a little bit weird. I want us to solidify that in our minds. I have made you, hey, this is your part. This is where we come in all together. Do I need a count? Can we do that? One, two, three. I have made you a light for the Gentiles that you may bring salvation to the ends of the earth. Yes, absolutely. And remember, Gentiles is this word, because, you know, growing up in church, I was a Gentile. What does that mean, right? Gentiles is a word that just means people who are not Jewish or traditionally were considered to be far from God. That's whenever you read that word Gentiles, it just means somebody who's not Jewish and considered to be far from God. And this word salvation, we, you know, we say that word a lot, but it's a theological word that basically means rescue. Rescue from a life enslaved to sin and its consequences and its ultimate consequence of death and suffering apart from God to be with God for eternity. So it's, it's rescued from and rescued for God. And this is what Paul and Barnabas are doing in our text, right? They're journeying around, and as they travel from town to town, they are finding ways to glow in the communities and the, in the people's lives that they encounter. Remember, they are on a missionary journey. Last week, we learned the ways they glowed in Iconium, right? That, that town that sounds like an element in the periodic table. They were figuring out ways to glow in Iconium and help people discover who Jesus is and, and develop to become like him. Others who rejected Jesus, they got upset at Paul and his companion. And so Paul and Barnabas, they left for Lystra. And this is where we're going to be today, learning some more practical ways to glow in our community today, like Paul and Barnabas did back then. And you can find this account in Acts chapter 14, verses 8 through 20. If you have your Bible or electronic device, I'd invite you to turn there. And, and maybe you can pay a little bit more close attention to the text. Otherwise, we're going to throw it up on the screen. Uh, but while we're looking that up, with, with summer approaching, you all excited for summer? Right? It's going to be hot. Getting our flowers. My apple trees are already blossoming. And some of us are going on vacations. And we're going to get a break from school. And other of us, there's new and exciting things that are going on. I heard about grandchildren being born. I hear about people getting married and, and those kinds of things. Summer's always a fun time for that. But as a little kid, I used to love summer because in the early summer, these little bugs would come out. And I'd look out over my lawn and my yard and I'd begin to see these little flashes in, in different places. Y'all y'all like lightning bugs and fireflies and just sitting on the porch and watching those or being out wandering or driving somewhere and you see all these little flash 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 going on yeah i don't know if you know this or not that's actually a mating call right that's what those flashes are gone they say hey i'm looking for somebody right so that's all the flashes are, are going on and if you've ever chased them you run up and and you wait and you see a flash and you see it and then you see this little bug hovering by and you catch it 
you got it in your hands, and you just open up and you peek in there and you see that little light flash in your hands and you're like, ooh, cool. And sometimes you get a little jar, you put them in a jar and hopefully you punch holes in the top. Other not, it doesn't work so well. But you punch holes in the top and maybe you catch a little jar full of those lightning bugs and you shake them up a little bit or maybe you got a little bug house that you keep them in. And I know this is gross, but we all did it. You'd wait for that light to blink and then you'd squish, <laughs> right? And then you have glowing guts all over your hands, right? And we just, we love that part about summer. It's so exciting and, and it's so fun watching all the flashes of light out in the yard or in the field. Super attractive. And reality is that the firefly was an inspiration for the glow stick. The, the chemical reaction within the, the firefly called bioluminescence because it's a process that's happening biologically, right? It's, it's bioluminescence. And it was eventually mimicked by Dr. Edwin Chandros and produced by a process called chemical luminescence. That's, that's what got us these. That's what got us some glow sticks. We got a little bit different kinds this morning. They actually make bracelets. Does anybody want a glow stick this morning? We got one there. I got a few of them. Let's see. Anybody else? Glow sticks, glow sticks. Man, all the college students up front, they're raising their hands. Look at that. You're going to have to chase that one. I got more. I got like eight of them. So that was a terrible throw. See, I... Oh, let's see. Oh, man. Let's see. Anybody else? I got a few more. I got a few of my... <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Here you go, guys. Oh, is it bounce and roll? All right, one more. We'll see how many we, these we can get out. There you go. There you go. Oh, they, they bounce. They bounce. Okay. Now, there's somebody way in the back over there. I got to see if we can launch this all the way out there, right? We're going to give it a shot. Give it a shot, right? Let's see. All right. Way in the back over there. Oh, I almost fell off the stage. And so I didn't learn my lesson with throwing stuff towards and back from the stage last week. So anyway, but um, these glow sticks were patented by several scientists back in 1976. And while the chemicals used in the biological or the man-made glowing process may be different, what makes people glow, what makes you and I glow, what made Paul and Barnabas glow is, is not chemical, it isn't biological, it's supernatural, it's spiritual, it's relational. The reality of what happens when Jesus enters into our lives and what happens when we spend time with him and ironically the more time that we spend with Jesus the more we glow the brighter we shine you we can't help it you know they used to make those glow things a while back like in different shapes of animals and different things like that and you'd shine a light on them right you have to shine a light on them until they eventually glowed and the more light you shine on them the brighter and the longer they glow and that's like us with Jesus. The more time we spend with Jesus, the more we reflect his light, the more that we glow in those dark places where there's people who are lost and hurting and who don't know him. And here's the reality in our lives. If, if we're struggling with glowing or, or we're not glowing, the question becomes, how's our relationship with Jesus? Do we know him? Have we been spending time with him? Because when we spend time with him, we can't help but glow like Paul and Barnabas. And Lystra, it says, there was a man that was lame. He'd, never, he'd been that way from birth and had never walked. He listened to Paul as he was speaking. Paul looked directly at him, saw that he had faith to be healed, and called out, stand up on your feet. And at that, the man jumped up and began to walk. That's crazy. When you think, here's a guy who's been laying on a mat his entire life. He's never been able to walk before. And Paul sees something in him. And he calls it out and and what that what that shows me is that Paul Paul is aware of what's going on around him he's tuned in to what's going on around him there's something about this man from his his countenance from his attitude from what he's saying from how he's responding that Paul sees there's something happening in him now I don't know if this is the first time that he's heard the gospel I don't know if this is the first time that he heard Paul because from later on the ta chapter we get the sense that Paul's been there for a minute so this may have been the first conversation this may have been the second conversation but either way this guy is hungry 
There's a mustard side seed of, seed of faith starting to blossom in him. And, and Paul calls it out. He notices this guy has a desire for more, and he says, get up. And the crippled man, he, he doesn't say, Paul, I don't know if you know this or not, but I'm crippled. I can't get up. <laughs> That's not what he says. He doesn't say, I can't. No, he doesn't explain the impossibility of what Paul is asking him to do. No, he just obeys. He just gets up. And he does it. Just as we see happening with an account with Peter and John just a few chapters earlier in Acts chapter 3. They're walking on to the temple, and this guy's like, hey, I need some money. And they're like, silver and gold I don't have, but what I have I give you in the name of Jesus. Get up and walk. And the guy gets up, and he walks, because there's something about him that says, I need something. I want more. I'm hungry. And Peter and John... And Paul and Barnabas, and what we notice about them is that there is an awareness of the people around them who are living in darkness. The people around them who need Jesus. There's an awareness that God wants to do something in their lives. He wants to work in their lives, which tells us we glow effectively when we're watchful for receptivity. We glow effectively when we're paying attention to the world and the people and the neighborhoods and the individuals around us. And we're looking for that receptivity. Paul here in this account saw the man had faith, a faith that was waiting to be cultivated. I remember several years back visiting a family um, in the hospital because their daughter had been in this terrible car accident. Very similar to the one that I've mentioned that I'd been in. Except it happened 15 years prior, uh, or 15 years after the one that I had been in. And she was in a very similar situation. She was in a hospital room. She was on life support. She was on the same floor in, in nearly the same place. And this lady from our church called me up and said, Tim, uh, there's this family. Their daughter's been in a terrible accident. I, I would like for you to come up and meet them and tell your story. And I'd love for you to pray with them and, and bring Jesus into this situation. Because they're in a dark place right now. And they need the light of Jesus. They need the hope of Jesus. And so I went and I prayed with the family, trying my best to minister to them in their time of need. I, I talked with the stepdad very extensively about Jesus and why I had hope in him and how he could even too have hope in him in this very difficult situation that was going all the while trying to be sensitive to where they were at. And I prayed with them and I went home and then a few days later, to my dismay, I had found out that they had removed her from life support. And it was hard. It was difficult. It was difficult for their family. It was difficult for this friend that had called me up. It was difficult for me. And I thought, man, I need to go there. I need to go to this funeral. This lady from my church, she went to the funeral. And we're there and we're ministering to the family as best as we possibly can. Hoping that just somehow they'll see the light of Jesus or a reflection, or we'll be able to glow in some capacity. And honestly, I, I don't know what the results of us ministering to that family at that time were. I never really saw any fruit from the conversation besides the person from our church being thankful that I had come with her. And while the end result may not have been what we had hoped, the reality is that lady from our church, in her willingness to enter into that dark place with Jesus in her, she was glowing. She was glowing. Whether people responded to her or not, she was glowing. She was glowing because she saw a need in the people's lives around her, a need in our community, and she was willing to step in and minister, not wait for somebody else to do it, but just be obedient and jump in and go. And because she was able to do that, there were other doctors and nurses who were able to listen to the ensuing conversations that it went on. We were able to observe and hear about Jesus and, and somebody was glowing in their life. Because here's the reality of my friends. People are most open to spiritual conversations during difficult life transitions. That's when they tend to look up, when things are dark, when things are hard, when things are difficult. Much, much like this crippled man, right? He's never walked. Right? And here's everybody every day around him walking doing things that he could only dream about, running, dancing, jumping, swimming, and he's just sitting on his mat, probably in a really dark place, 
whatever facade he puts on emotionally, he's probably in a dark place. And all of a sudden, here's Paul talking about this newness of life, this hope that he can have in Jesus. And he begins to hear about it over and over and over as Paul talks and ministers. Suddenly something clicks, and he's like, I'm up for that. Paul says, stand up, and bam, he gets up, and his life is changed forever. God does something amazing. And I promise you, friends, even though it may not be in the moment or where you're at right now, if we continue to glow like Paul, watchful for the receptivity around us, if we glow like this friend of mine from the church several years back, eventually somebody is going to respond. Eventually somebody is going to see the light of Jesus in our lives, and they're going to say, I need that. I want it. I have to have it. My life is such a mess right now. I need the light of Jesus. Someone will come alive through our helping to cultivate their faith in Him because I've seen it and I've watched it happen. In fact, let me share with you some key opportunities in which people are receptive to Jesus. Maybe you have some of them going on in your life right now in the people's lives that you know. Some of these include maybe changing jobs or moving to a new location or after the loss of a loved one or a friend. Maybe a school transition or a difficult diagnosis or a major life change. And that world that somebody is living in is like the crippled man. They're on the mat. They're living in darkness. They're wondering what's going to come of their situation. And they need that hope. And that's when we have the opportunity to glow or be a light in the darkness. For us, infused with Jesus, we have a very real present to bring, a very real opportunity to bring Jesus into their lives to be the hope that they're looking for. But, you know, also, it's not just negative, my friends. There's also positive situations where people are looking for hope, where they're open to spiritual conversations, when they're on a new start, when they need a fresh start. There's a lot of marriages happening summertime. That's usually the season for them. Newlyweds are often looking for something new, something more. That's a great opportunity. After the birth of a child or the adoption of a child, families and individuals are often open to having spiritual conversations. Or retirement. Maybe that's approaching and we're looking for something new. We're looking for new meaning, new purpose in life. We've been sitting in this circumstances for so long and now it's like, oh, what are we going to do now? Well, Jesus has an answer for that. But the bottom line is to glow effectively. We want to, like Paul, like Barnabas, like Peter, like John, we want to be aware of the people around us. The, the people who may be metaphorically sitting on a mat and looking for more and who have never experienced the new, newness that Jesus can bring in their life. People who are receptive. But listen, because if we look at verse 11, we see that when the the crowd saw what Paul had done. They, they shouted in Lyconian language. They see him say to this guy, get up. The guy gets up. It's crazy. And they're like, whoa, what's going on here? The gods have come down to us in human form. Barnabas, they call Zeus. And Paul, they call Hermes because he is the chief speaker. The priest of Zeus in that area whose temple was just outside the city, he brought bulls and wreaths to the city gates because he and the crowd wanted to offer sacrifice to these guys. But when Paul and Barnabas and, and Paul, when, when, they, when they heard about this, they tear their clothes, right? They tear their clothes, and they rush out of the crowd shouting, friends, why are you doing this? We too are only human like you. We are bringing you good news, telling you to turn from these worthless things to the living God who made heaven and earth and sea and everything in them. In the past, he let other nations go their own way, yet he has not left himself without testimony. He's shown kindness to you with, with rain from above, and crops in their seasons. He provides you with plenty of food and fills your heart with joy. And yet even at these words, when Paul and Barnabas are saying, it's not us, it's not us, we didn't do anything, it's God. The, the people still struggle with wanting to give them glory and wanting to give them praise. While that sounds weird, like, like who would do that? According to the commentator William Barclay, there was a legend in this area. This kind of helps us understand what's going on. There was a legend in this area 
that a long time ago, before Paul and Barnabas ever showed up, that, that the Greek gods Zeus and Hermes, they actually came down in human form. And they were in disguise. And while they're there mingling around with the people, nobody shows any friendliness to them. Nobody shows any hospitality to them. Nobody welcomes them into their home or anything like that, except for these two peasants. They're the only ones who show these gods in disguise any kind of hospitality. And as a result, when the gods make themselves known, they wipe out everybody. Everybody else is destroyed except for these two peasants who then become guardians in their temple. And then when they died, the story is they became the trees that were outside the temple. Super crazy, I know, but this was what they, they were believing. This is what a large number believed. And they didn't want to suffer the same consequences as those of legend, so they tried to worship Paul and Barnabas. They wanted to give them praise and credit for what only God could do. Only, only God could heal this crippled state. So they must be gods. But instead of taking the credit for that, Paul and, and Barnabas, they, they tear their clothes. They're like, no, 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 it's just, this is not us. And let's face it, for many of us, we like to take credit for things. We like to receive a pat on the back and an attaboy and a good job, or we're at least tempted to take credit for things. Sometimes even for things we didn't do, because it feels nice to be appreciated, doesn't it? It does feel nice to be appreciated. It feels nice to be valued. And there's nothing wrong with having a measure of appreciation for or receiving appreciation. But if we're not careful receiving that over and over again and being told, well done and good job and you're so talented and boy, you're just amazing and, and I can't believe you and all those kinds of things. Eventually what happens is our egos start to get inflated. We start to get a bit of a big head and we start to believe that we're responsible for things that happen in our lives when we're actually not responsible for them. And I imagine for a long time the Apostle Paul felt like he was something felt like he was something. He had worked very hard studying the law, following it to the letter, preparing potentially for a role among the Sanhedrin, the religious governing and ruling council among the Jewish people. He probably struggled with an ego. But there came this point in his life that we read about in Acts chapter 9 where he was thrown off his horse and he met Jesus. And Jesus reminded him of why he was worthy of glory and Paul was not. He reminded him that it's not about you, Paul. It's about me. And what I want to do and how I want to work in your life. So much to the point where Paul wrote in Philippians 3, verse 7, but whatever were worth gains to me, whatever things I've done well or accomplished, I now consider them loss for the sake of knowing Christ. What is more, I consider everything a loss because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord, for whose sake... I have lost all things. I consider them garbage. That I may gain Christ and be found in Him, not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law or by my own efforts or my own works or all my own performance, but that which is through faith in Christ. You see, Paul knew he couldn't take credit for God's mercy. He couldn't take credit for God's blessing in his life, for the miracle that had been done before this whole crowd in Lystra and the the crippled man because he knew to do so would jeopardize the work and the ministry that God wanted to do among this people group. These people who were in darkness that would jeopardize them coming into the light. Helping us understand that we only glow effectively when we learn to shift any kind of praise or success or credit back to God. We glow effectively when we take the praise that we receive and we put it where it rightfully belongs and that's at the feet of Jesus. We glow effectively when we shift any kind of praise or credit back to God. If we start taking credit for what God does through us, people miss out on the life and abundance He has to offer, either because they see through us and recognize we're nothing but power-hungry, self-loving individuals, or even worse, because they buy into the lie that we're something when we're not. It's like we read about of Jesus' cousin, John the Baptist. Remember the... Remember the account of John the Baptist? He came from the wilderness. He wore camel's hair. Can you imagine wearing camel's hair? That might be kind of itchy, I imagine. 
And what's he snacking on, right? He's popping locusts and eating honey. Crunch, crunch, crunch. Right? That's got to be a tasty meal. He's got a leather rope around his waist. And he comes with this message, repent for the kingdom of God is at hand. People are convicted and they start coming in droves to the Jordan to be baptized by him. And he's baptizing all these people and all these people from all over are coming to see what's going on with John. And he's like a celebrity. Right? And he's just saying, repent for the kingdom of God is near. Repent for the kingdom of God is near. And he's got this huge following. All these people are coming. And suddenly Jesus shows up on the scene. And all of a sudden, people start shifting their attention from John over to Jesus. And Jesus is teaching people. And crowds of people are listening to the message that Jesus has to share. And Jesus is baptizing people. And one of John's followers comes up to him and says, hey, Rabbi. Which means teacher. He says, hey, Rabbi, you see this Jesus guy over here? Look at everybody. They're turning all their attention to him. What's going on, man? And, and what does is, what is John the Baptist say? Remember? He must increase. I must decrease. Right? Because John's got the right attitude. It's not about me, guys. I'm just the messenger. It's about Jesus. I can't do anything in your life. I can't make it better. I I can't fix you or help you get to where you ought to be. That's not within my ability. Only Jesus can do that because he is our source of light. Light that brings life. We can have our accomplishments and our accolades, and our victories. But they're only useful, they're only beneficial, they're only effective when we can lay them at the feet of Jesus and say to God be the glory. Look what he's done in my life. He can do the same in yours. I who I am, I am who I am today, not, not because of me, not because of what I've done, not because of how I've been raised or where I came from, simply because of what Jesus has done in my life. Christ in me, the hope of salvation. We do well when we succeed. And although we may be tempted to take credit for a job well done, for victory in our life, for an accomplishment, we do well when we put that credit back into God's hands. And we say, look what he's done. And maybe that looks like a humble attitude, not necessarily tearing your clothes like, like Paul and Barnabas. I'm not saying the next time somebody says, good job, go, ah, and rip your clothes. You know, that's not what I'm saying. But maybe rather assume a humble attitude. And maybe that looks like a a consistent, steady faithfulness and just doing what's expected of you, what's asked of you. Or maybe that's verbally responding with a simple thank you. Or simple acknowledgement of one's gratitude and then getting back to things as usual. Or maybe that looks like an appropriate verbal statement such as we see here where we acknowledge, you know, really the person we ought to give credit to is God. I'm, I'm just doing my best. Glory belongs to him. Or maybe it's not even, maybe it's not even a, a, a platform of public acknowledgement. Maybe it's just simply going home, getting on your knees in your bedroom and saying, God, thank you for the blessings in my life. I recognize that everything I have is yours. I just want to honor you with it. I just want to give it back to you. That's when we glow effectively, when we put credit where it is due. But you know, we encountered a little bit of this next point last week. We look at verses 19 to 20. Something else happens. It's a bit of a pattern. The text says on this missionary journey when they were in Lystra and they healed this guy and he raised and everybody was excited and they came rushing to Paul and Barnabas and they wanted to worship him. It says, then some Jews came from Antioch and Iconium and they won the crowd over and they stoned Paul and dragged him out of the city thinking he was dead. But after the disciples had gathered around him, he got up and he went back into the city. The next day he and Barnabas left for Derbe and to be clear, it's entirely possible that the people took him out of the city to stone him because they were afraid. Not necessarily because they disagreed with him, although we know that is true of a large portion 
of the individuals there, we can assume that some of the Jews were afraid, afraid of Roman repercussion because of the, the stir or the riots that were resulting from those disagreeing with Paul and Barnabas' message concerning Jesus. In fact, that's one of the reasons the religious leaders wanted to do away with Jesus. Because they were afraid of all the stir and commotion that he was causing and afraid that the Romans would come down and just wipe everybody out. They wanted to go along, to get along. But notice here what Paul did after he was stoned. If we're not careful, we miss it. The text says he got up and he went back into the city. He got up, he went back into the city. He went right back to those who had tried to murder him. And here's the point. We glow effectively when we endure opposition. We glow effectively when we endure opposition. John Wesley is quoted as saying, always look a mob in the face. Helping us understand, glowing requires courage. As Paul said to his companion Timothy, God has not given us over to a spirit of fear or timidity, but of power and of love and of self-discipline or self-control. And notice, you know, in this point, we're not saying seek opposition. We're not saying seek opposition. We're saying enduring opposition. There's a difference. Because some people are, are out looking for a fight. So, some people are out looking for a fight. But as Christians and followers of Jesus, we don't go looking for fights. We endure. God has already fought. The victory is already won. The scriptures call us to withstand. This is what Ephesians 6 teaches us. After putting on the whole armor of God, it doesn't say take your sword and go out and do battle. It says stand. Stand, and after you have done everything to stand, stand firm then. Or keep standing, because we glow effectively when we stand. When we endure opposition. My favorite superhero of all time is Captain America. Any Captain America fans in the house? Captain America is not armed with a sword, very interestingly. He is armed with a shield. And if you recall from the more recent movies, there's a scene before he goes through his whole transformation process and he's just a regular guy, this little wimpy guy, just very brittle, meager looking guy that always is trying to stand up for others and, and do the right thing. There's a scene in the movie where he gets in a fight with a guy that's much larger, larger and, and much bigger. And, and so they go outside and they're in the back alley and they're fighting and he's got his fists up like this. And, and the big guy just, boom, hits him in the face, knocks him down, he falls to the ground. And he gets back up and he gets back in his fighting stance. And the big guy just, boom, nails him again, lays him out. He falls into the garbage bags. He gets back up. He's like ready to fight again. And the, the guy hits him again. And he says, would you just stay down? And he gets up. And do you remember what he says? I can do this all day. Right? You can knock me down. But I'm going to get right back up again. I can do this all day. And that goes on to be a theme in the Captain America movies, it goes back to be a theme in the Marvel movies throughout. He doesn't quit. He keeps standing back up in a similar way. That's what we see here happening with Paul and Barnabas. They get docked down with rocks by a mob, left for dead. They're down. They're hurting. They're out. But they don't stay down. They get back up. And they go back to the very people who tried to kill them and continue to minister. And here's the crazy thing. In Acts 16, Paul goes back to these people. He's on his second missionary journey. And he goes back to Lystra again. And not only does he continue to strengthen the believers who continue to grow, the ministry continues to go there. But also he finds one of his primary companions there who ministers alongside of him and plants churches with him named Timothy. Timothy comes out of that people group out of that area of darkness and so now not only does he glow but now he does so with the church and my friends if you if we are enduring some kind of opposition today if we're enduring some kind of opposition maybe relational 
may be physical, may be financial, or even spiritual, and it feels like you're being hit with rocks or pummeled from every side, can I encourage us, like Paul and like Barnabas, don't give up. Don't quit glowing. Don't quit shining for God and giving Him glory. Don't quit honoring Him with your lifestyle and your choices and the way that you live. Don't quit having spiritual conversations with those who are receptive, even though you may be facing hardship. Even though those conversations aren't turning out the way you want them to, and you're not seeing the response you're seeing, because God is going to be faithful. He's going to use that in your life. He's going to use it in their life. He's going to use it in somebody else's life. If you just keep trusting Him in that situation. If you would, I'm going to ask you to stand, and we're going to sing. And we're going to have a couple more messages in our series before we finish this first missionary journey of Paul's. But my hope is, is that as we're reading through this journey, that it's not just information. It's not just come and hear a, a nice message that's maybe well-crafted or put together, or maybe not. But my hope is that God is stirring and moving in our lives. That we're realizing that we're sitting on a mat. We're laying here and God wants to do something amazing in our life so he can be on display, so we can do amazing thing in other people's lives. And although we may be hurt, although we may be down, although we may feel not good enough to be used by God, he calls us and he wants to use us. He invites us to be used by him. He wants us to glow. Because listen, my friend, when, when Jesus is in our life, like I said at the very beginning, we can't help but glow. We, we, we don't just sit in a room. We're not just in this place. We're not just at our homes. Oh, I'm glowing for Jesus. He invites us to shine, to live it out in our community. We got to go. We can't keep this message to ourselves. We got to go into the places that are dark because there's people there who need rescue. They need to come out of the dark and experience the light and the life and the abundance of Jesus. Last week when we finished the message, I challenged us to think of the places that we need to begin going to repeatedly. Those areas that maybe aren't as bright as they could be where people need to experience God's light. And we can be that light if he is in us. We just go there and be there. And then I also asked us to think of maybe who is in that environment. Maybe it's a neighbor. Maybe it's a friend. Maybe it's a coworker. Maybe it's a family member. So how can we go and glow in their lives? How can we go and be present in their lives? And today I want to offer that same challenge because the mission hasn't changed. We're still called to go, and we're still called to glow. And I don't know, maybe you're here this morning, and your heart is stirring, and you realize that, man, you need the newness of Jesus. You need him in your own life. You need to get up. You've been lying on a mat for years and years and years. And Jesus is calling you to get up.